Um, we are uh, a little bit early, so uh, please don't um, leave the room yet. Uh, lunch is only served in about 10-12 uh, minutes, because web components are so delightfully simple, it doesn't take full half hour to uh, ex explain them. So could I please ask um, our, our, uh, all our three speakers get on stage and we'll do a little live Q&A um, just to hassle them. So uh, while you think of if you have any questions, um, you can just uh, raise your hand in a bit and, uh, and Juho will run you a mic. But I'll just start off with just one question. Um, this is a React conference after all. Uh, and I think Matthias, you said that you know, React is officially getting web component support in version 19. Uh, but until then, what is it that anybody who wants to you know, play with web components in their current application that is built in React, what is it that they can do um, to sort of start, get started? Well, I mean, you can get started straight off the bat, so you don't really need any compatibility to get started with Web Components. But with, before we get React 19 and the complete Web Component support, there's a couple of like pitfalls you might run into. So support for custom events, for example, is something that's not shipped in React 18 currently. And the second thing is that Boolean attributes might Act, like, act a little bit different than you might be expecting them to act like. But mm. if you are not using those, you are pretty much good to go. And even if you are using those, you can just, there's some, there's a package by the lit team that's called lit labs react, which pretty much creates react components out of your web components. And you can pretty much reactify them at, at that cost. And even if you wrote the compatibility yourself, it's just a couple of lines of code. I, I have to actually shield that uh, last year I did a React Finland talk about using web components in React and it was React 17 or React 18. So if you're interested in doing it already now, go on YouTube, search my name and you should find it. <laughs> Thank you very much. So do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, we have quite a few actually. Um, uh, you asked the question last time, so let's go there first, the man with the hat. Uh, Oh, is the mic now working? Oh, um, yeah, you can. Is it working? Oh, yes, it is. Okay, hi. Uh, I have a question about accessibility because it's, it seems to use a custom HTML elements. So if you are like um, visually impaired and you have a, a reading device for the blind, does it work with like normal HTML even though they are custom elements? Uh, yeah, sure. Like, especially if you're only talking about text, like then there's uh, all accessibility tools just work fine. Because like for the uh, accessibility tools, the the DOM, the shadow DOM is like just the normal DOM. So whenever it finds the text content in that shadow DOM, it will also just read it out. Like it gets a little bit tricky when you come into like using forms, like inputs or checkboxes. Then there is like still some work that needs to be done to make this truly nice. But right now, sort of like the common workaround that most uh, design systems are doing is like putting their, uh, their actual in inputs, like the, the native inputs, into the light DOM so that they all are sharing the same form system, like the same form DOM. And then they are fully accessible. And then you can also use link areas, uh, area described by, with IDs to link to each other. Because those are still not possible to do across uh, shadow routes. But this is. Yeah, it's been in the works for quite some time, but there's a lot of things you need to do first, like element internals, and they're finally shipped everywhere. So now, like, it's the time to, uh, yeah, to improve on these, and these steps will come. But as a developer, you still need to kind of make sure that your site is accessible. It's not accessible by default just because it's a web platform API. Absolutely correct. Yes. Like, it's, making it accessible is still a lot of work, but it's a lot of work in React, it's a lot of work in Vue, it's a lot of work in Web Components. Like, the work, just doesn't disappear. <laughs> you still need to do it. It's a lot of work, for sure. All right, great. All right, uh, we had another question over there. Hi again. So I would like to play devil's advocate for a bit. Uh, you say that there are many, you know, benefits to web components, CSS encapsulation, uh, some uh, SSR capabilities, and so on. But uh, my counterpoint would be why not use Next.js because you can use CSS modules, you have SSR, you have React server components, you have uh, accessibility, 
you have pretty much anything you can ask for. So what is the reason for me to go over to web components? What are the great benefits? That's a great question, thanks. <laughs> um, I guess it's, it's not a competition about which one is the best and should rule them all, or, and, and which one we should use or not use. It's definitely um, be driven by your developer experience and when you are, what you are expecting. Um, when you start thinking about working on a design system and building things upon a, a design system, if you start to work on different kind of technologies because you are producing different apps using the same design system, but with different kind of technologies because because there is a lot of reason, then having something that is common and understood by any kind of different frameworks that could be served as a foundation to build upon everything else, then web components is a good answer. If your stack is full React and, uh, and, and your team is full React and you, and you know that you won't change this technology for the next five years, yeah, maybe you don't have to think about using it at some point, but if you want to, like you said, sprinkle some kind of features and have it reusable outside of this very specific context, it's really, really useful, I guess. So. Yeah, I, I'm not an expert in this, but it did occur to me that the titles of your three talks are kind of interestingly an answer to, to that question as well. For one, you can avoid you know, vendor lock-in and technology lock-in. For example, if you want to be moving your application layer from React to Solid, um, you know, if you are building on web components, you actually have a lot more sort of transferable you know, assets moving from one. Then you have the idea of like shipping you know, code as components, you know, which is something that doesn't depend on having a big framework. You know, it works with everything. And then finally, you get this islands architecture and hydration, which is something that's really impossible to do with the kind of React uh, server rendering model currently. So in some ways, that's just the titles, you know, answer kind of that question in a very, very interesting way. Um, did you have anything else on, on that? Cool. Uh, any more questions? Uh, here's one over here. On the, on the right oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, there's one more. I see you, my man. Uh, hi. So uh, this, I think, ties in with the previous question a bit. Uh, so let's say I come back after React Finland home and uh, I get to work and uh, I try to convince my boss to start writing some stuff using web components and uh, then he asks, I tell him all the good things about it, uh, that it's very performant, it doesn't load uh, much JS, it can be server-side rendered, etc. And he asks me, uh, what are the drawbacks? Like, what do you think is at the moment uh, the biggest drawback or trade-off that we are making? Well, I can start by answering that. As in, as in programming, always it depends because, uh, for example, if your company is relying on a global CSS design system, so your still building everything on bootstrap or something like that, then when you have styling encapsulation, you are going to have to rethink all of your styling at that point because you cannot just use global CSS to go everywhere in there. I think, does Thomas want to give the next drawback to this? <laughs> does Mads have some drawbacks? I think like the styling one is one of the biggest that I hear that companies run into and then they start writing web components in light DOM so they are not adopting the shadow DOM approach of it and that's that's a thing that is going to turn into a foot gun in half a year or a year and then you're going to be wondering why you didn't use shadow DOM to begin with. So I mean, one thing like especially if you have a huge existing application like it's if you have a already complex situation then introducing another stack is always sort of like hard so if you already use server-side rendering with React, then like this story is by far not ready. So like if you have an SPA and you need server-side rendering and you want to introduce web components, you need to be aware that they will not be server-side rendered in the near future. Like I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on React and on the web component side and on lit SSR uh, to support this. Um, and I think one thing, it's also like, but it's also like one of the benefits, so to say, like if you have web components, you can put everywhere and you can or maybe even create sort of like Frankensteins in the sense that you could hide inside of a web component a lot of complexity. So theoretically, 
you could have a web component that loads a full own React. You could have a web component that loads Angular inside there. But then, honestly, like it theoretically can work, <laughs> but I don't want to be responsible for this Webpack or roll-up configuration that enables this. So I think it's sort of like a funny thing that in front end, apparently, it's seen as the norm that we can combine everything. Whereas, like, have you ever asked like a Java developer, hey, I want to now introduce some Ruby into your Java code base? Yeah. <laughs> like, in front end, it's possible, yes, because of how, how, yeah, how the setup of browsers work. But it is, I'm not sure if it's like, always the best case. <laughs> so it is a step by step. But the RAM components are really nice. Like, if you can do really a step by step migration, you can really just say 90% is everything is the same, and only this page does something special. And then you can do it step by step and do that. So but I, it is work, for I think sure. I can provide some additional viewpoint on this uh, discussion about web components. So I work, or work with this client. I won't name names because there's a story. So they have this application I call Hydra. They don't know it, but I call it Hydra. So what they did, they built a jQuery application on top of which they built Angular application, on top of which they built React application, and they used Redux, Redux and Rx and whatever is the latest state manager. So they more or less have a huge amount of different technologies in their legacy app. And of course, the boss always wants more features, so they never have time to refactor properly. But, but the way I understand it is, this, is that what they're doing over time is that they're writing web components to sort of slay the Hydra. So they like you take some old jQuery code, Angular code, whatever, you push it to web component, and you reduce the complexity from the past, from the legacy code. Uh, thank you, Yuho. I think that went in the category more of a comment, less of a question. Uh, yeah, but, uh, it's, it, there's no, no, no question here, but this is just a comment. <laughs> yes. Like, if, if you deal with some legacy code that's completely weird, maybe it's a way out. It's okay. He pays the bill, so he gets to speak to the I, microphone. I think we can still take one more question. <laughs> yes, let's do one more question uh, over here. Oh. Maybe we two two questions. I don't know. Uh, I mean, okay. So let's put it this way: the lunch is served now. So if somebody is uh, very hungry, uh, feel free to quietly make your way out. But other than that, we can do a couple more questions for sure. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, how you handle reactivity in web components because you know we love React because, as the name uh, says, it's reactive. So uh, it's very easy to uh, maintain the uh, logical uh, layer and the visual layer and how you do it easy in web components. Yeah, I think like there's a, a very clear sort of separation in that sense. You have a web component and then has a local state and these are just properties and attributes. So the same way that an input has a value, the same way and uh, your custom element can have a value X. And then you can use like f libraries like lit that enable uh, the same reactivity that you know from, from anywhere else. So whenever you change the value X, it will automatically re-render and only update the DOM parts that are actually changing. And this is like the, the local state, and I think I personally really like that to be keeping this to the components, so can I actually, in the DOM, I can just like select my element, and I can do $0.value X equals something, and I can actually change it directly without needing to code anything. And, but if you talk about global state, like then it's exactly the same as in, in React. So like you will use some service like Redux or, or Signal or some global object with a proxy. It's exactly the same. And then the only thing you need to do in order to hook into, uh, for example, lit, is you would need to say, hey, something changed, please re-render. So the, the, I think the data, is ex the data story is exactly the same as with React. Just the local state is maybe a little bit different because it's sort of like browser properties instead of like React uh, state. All right, and I think we have one more question. Esamati over here. Yeah, um, if I understand correctly, the attributes in web components are just strings. So what would be your recommendation if you have to pass like an array of objects to a web component? How, how would you do it? You just pass it as a property. <laughs> like it, it's the same as with, uh, with a JavaScript, uh, like whenever you select an element, if you can, you can only set an attribute, which is like then in HTML, or you set a property, and the property can be anything. So that is like 
a property is uh, just native JavaScript and it's native into to the DOM. And there's maybe often the confusion that like in React, like properties and attributes are very much the same. Whereas like in HTML, they are completely separate. Sort of if you put a value attribute on, on, on an input, for example, and you set a value like to foo, and then whenever you change it on the actual uh, JavaScript side, like my element dot value equals something, the HTML will not even change. So the attribute is sort of like usually only or mostly used to like reflect information to the DOM or to get information from the DOM. And everything else that's more complex, you pass on as direct JavaScript objects. And, and do frameworks like lit or, or stencil kind of uh, spec over this to make it easier to use as well? Correct. Yes. All right. Well, I think that was a pretty good Q&A. So we are not going to do a third floor Q&A after this talk. We'll let our speakers eat uh, along with the rest of us. But if you do have any questions for them, please just tap them on the shoulder in the hallways when you do see them. And uh, thank you very much uh, to our speakers, Matthias, Mads, and Thomas.